Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to have most of us back in one room together? Praise the Lord. This morning we had about, uh, I don't remember. See, so how many we have outside? 60, 62 outside in cars this morning. So praise the Lord for that. Grateful to God. I feel like we're getting the band back together. So here I want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, we had it's kind of, it's that time of year you should have gotten an email about deacon nominations and so you can print the way we want to do it is you can print those out and send them to you as an email as a PDF you can print those out if you want a hard copy there's some on both chairs right here right and left of me they're also in the vestibule right in front of the offering box and and you'll receive another email this week with kind of some instructions and thoughts and. And uh, maybe some biblical support of the role in the office of deacon in the church. But here's what I would say to you first. I would say that um, before you fill this out, you ought to pray about this. You really should pray about who you're nominating to serve as deacon in the church. It is not a lifetime achievement award. It is a biblical office that God has designed. And so I think there should be a calling on people's lives. So I would encourage you to pray about it. And here's the next step. I would encourage you to go to the person and say, I am praying about nominating you to serve as deacon. Would you pray about that as well? And uh, it's always been my experience. That's a good first question to ask somebody. Because someone may say, I'm never, ever going to serve. God's not called me to that. And I'm confident of that. And so I think it's very helpful if we do that. We are grateful to God that you're here. We're going to have a wonderful day of worship. We're going to read the scriptures together. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray for our nation together. We're going to sing some, some songs that you're very familiar with about our nation. And uh, we're going to pray for our nation. And then we are going to sing some more. And or they're going to sing. I guess if somebody's not in front of you, you can sing. If they're in front of you and you might endanger them with whatever might project out of your mouth, if you know what I'm saying, it's taken me like four weeks to figure out how to say that. So just be careful. We want to we want to uh, to be safe about this. And then we're going to sing and we're going to hear the word of God preached. And it's going to be a wonderful day as we're one step closer to uh, to normal in our church. Good morning. I've been asked to read Psalm 145, verses 8 through 15. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are bowed <coughs> and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're uh, grateful for this day that you've given us. And Father, for the opportunity to gather together. Father, continue to watch over us as our congregation is split between our drive-in service and this service. And Father, just continue to bless us as we go through this time. Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country that even allow us to worship today. And so, Father, grant us your grace and favor as we worship together. Lift up your name. Pray your blessings on us in Christ's name. We pray. Amen. In honor of our independence, begin. We're going to sing a couple of verses, uh, "Battle Hymn of the Republic," and then go right into "America the Beautiful."
We are grateful for the opportunity to live here in these United States of America. We're thankful especially for the freedom that you have granted for those to practice their religion. And Father, we are grateful to be able to gather together here, park outside at 8.30 and worship you freely, to come inside here and gather together and worship you. We're thankful for the blessing that you have given to, the, to these 50 states for many, many years. And we pray today that you would continue to bless this country. Father, we pray for its leaders. We pray for the president. We pray for the vice president. Pray for the governors. We pray for those elected in Congress. We pray for our Supreme Court justices. Father, we pray for our, our, our governors, our mayors, our county commissioners. Lord, for those from the highest elected office in the nation to those at the lowest level that are that you are using, you're using them to help govern us. You're using them to help uh, manage our resources as a country. And Father, we pray for revival in this country. We pray for people to come back to you, to know you in a personal way. Lord, we pray that things that would be important to us as believers would be important to our country. And Father, we know that there are many of those right now who maybe don't appreciate the freedoms that we have. Lord, might you bring about unity. Might, might the 4th of July remind them of how they have been blessed with freedoms in this country. And Father, we pray for those who through the years have served faithfully. We remember the families of those who, whose um, loved ones have laid down their lives from, from beaches to battlefields. They've given freely so that we could be free from tyranny. And Father, when we think about the idea of being free from tyranny, we're, we're most grateful that you sent your son that freed us from the tyranny of sin, set us free from the dominion and the shackles of sin, Lord, that we can live free in Christ. And so we celebrate mostly and most importantly that. And Father, we again thank you for this country. We know that it's not perfect. We know that this experiment uh, as a republic is not perfect. But we have been blessed and we're thankful. Lord, as we continue to worship today, when we worship you, our holy God, righteous, king, eternal, gracious, merciful, filled with loving kindness, filled with glory, Lord, you deserve to be worshipped, magnified, and might we do that as we continue this morning. God bless this service, and God bless our country. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to continue singing, and because he did, we're going to sing a few verses of Jesus Paid It All, and then go right into Jesus Messiah.
And I'd say, you know, what a, these four folks, what a, we couldn't have made it through this journey of, uh, of multiple services and, and um, trying to record and post things on the internet and all that we've done. And, and to each one of you, thank you. Y'all have been a blessing. It's been, a, um, I know it's been tough, lots of practices and weird schedules, but we're thankful. So listen, I am uh, 45 years old. I know my gray hair makes me look like I'm much older and wiser, but only a young whippersnapper at 45. But I've learned a lot in 25 years or 20 years of ministry. I've learned one thing. This is maybe the most important thing I've learned. Don't always say what you think. <laughs> Y'all ever been there? I was notorious as a chaplain in the Army. I was a very young chaplain in the Army. Most chaplains that go in are 27. I was 27 when I went on active duty. And... Um, and I kind of just often told people what I thought. And I remember on two occasions, kind of famous stories for me, two occasions. I won't tell you exactly what I said, but on one occasion we were in Iraq, and I, I said something, and I remember this major, his name was Major Bulick, I'll never forget it. He said, chaplain, outside, now. And I went out there outside the little tent, and he told me all about life, and uh, it was pretty brutal. And so I, I did this again after we got home, I remember. The next summer, our, our, we had folks in Fort Lewis, Washington, and we had a, we had a situation with a soldier and a, a married soldier and a pregnant girlfriend. And uh, I said something that what I thought about a decision that had been made, and I heard it again from another major, chaplain in my office now. And then he began to proceed to tell me, um, things I probably shouldn't say. So we all have had foolish moments where we have said foolish things. Anybody ever opened their mouth and inserted their foot? No. Some of you men on the way to church today, didn't you? <laughs> if you didn't, you will on the way home. And if, if, if it hasn't happened then, it'll probably happen at the lunch table. So here's the deal. Psalm 14, that's where we are this morning. Psalm 14, we'll continue in the summer in the Psalms, and we're going to see what a really foolish person says. Psalm 14, so let's honor the Lord by standing for his word. Psalm 14, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they are abominable deeds, there is none who, who does good, the Bible says. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man and sees if they are, are any who understand, who seek after God. The Bible says they all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generations of the righteous. Who should, who should shame the plans of the poor? But the Lord, he is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. The word of God for the people of God. May be seated. Just want to share with you a few thoughts about this passage and uh, just three simple words. Wow, three words. For those of y'all that like to take notes, this will be really easy because it'll just be three words. Here's the first word. The first word is denial. Denial. So here's what the Bible says in, in Psalm 14. He, he, the, the writer is David, and David says that the foolish person says there is no God. Now you all may, may know some of those people. Uh, I, was, uh, I was lost at 19. I didn't know Christ. I never really heard the gospel. But I didn't deny the existence of God. I believed there was a God. No one, if you would have pulled me over and said, do you believe there's a God? I'd have said, certainly there's a God. We can see God, can't we? We can see God in, our, in the creation. We can see God in, in the order. We can see God in the stars and the moon and the galaxies. We can see even God in the development of the human body and how it's made and how it's designed and how it works in such an intricate and beautiful way. We can see God in the human ear, right, as it 
caught sound and it follows sound down into an eardrum and we're able to hear things and hear, able to hear sounds and able to hear fireworks, right? Some of y'all heard that last night. So there's this verbal denial of God. And here's what the psalmist says, that that person is foolish. Well, let me go a step further. They're not only foolish, they are bound for hell. The person that denies the existence of God, that doesn't know God personally, their, their eternal state is going to be eternal justice. And um, I would remind you of this, and I'd say this, we're in a moment where if there's a buzzword for 2020, first it was the coronavirus, right? And now the buzzword is this. The buzzword is social justice. You turn on the TV and you hear the word social justice. There's even those in the church that are talking about how, are, how is the church involved in social justice? I would say this. We should be more concerned about eternal justice than social justice. One of them is important, certainly. But one of them is eternally important. And the writer here is saying a person who denies God that he even exists is foolish. Well, he's far more than foolish. He's bound for a, a eternity to be separated from God. And here's what some of you are thinking right now. You're saying, that's right, pastor. Go after those folks that don't know God. But many of us are actually what we would call practical atheists. So what's a practical atheist? You functionally deny God. How do you do this? In word, in, in other words, we live like there isn't a God. You say, well, how do we do that? Well, one way we do that is we deny this book. We deny its truths. We, we deny its precepts. We deny what it tells us to do. Well, if you're disobeying the word of God that's been given to us through writers inspired by the Holy Spirit, aren't you in a sense denying the existence of God. Here's another way. We rob God of his glory. And we say it's all about us. Look what I did. Yeah, I didn't do anything. Well, look how smart I am. Well, you're really not that smart. Or we'll say things to diminish his sovereignty. How, here's a favorite one. Well, what? Well, what? I was lucky, wasn't I? I was lucky. Wow. Or, wow, just by happenstance this happened. Wow, what, are the, what, what could ever have been the circumstances of this? Man, I just was, just look at this. No, it is a sovereign God who plans and orders the steps of every human being in every event in history. So when you think, look how smart I was to figure this out. No, it's a sovereign God controlling history. Every moment, every step, every guidestone. And so I would say, you may say, well, I'm, I believe that there's a God. Yes, but we sometimes deny him and are even foolish in our language about his connection with humanity. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you today, he has the hairs on your head numbered and he has the steps of your life ordered. Don't take so much credit. It really isn't about you. It really isn't about you. It's about the glory of God. That's the first word, denial. Here's a second word, very important. It's the word depravity. It's a theological word, and uh, it's a word we don't use a lot in church. It's like the word repent. But here's what the writer says. It's found in verses 1, 2, and 3. David the psalmist says this. He says, no one does good. No one does good. Can I remind you that your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus isn't good? They're not. You say, well, pastor, that's very indicting. Well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says no one does good, no, not one. The Bible also says here from this writer that there is none who seek after God. No one seeks after God. He goes on in verse 3 to say there is none who does good, no, not even one. Why? Why did this happen? What happened to humankind that it's been rendered in this condition? Simple, Genesis 3. You live in a post-Genesis 3 world. You live in a, in a fallen world. It can remind you of what happened. This slithering reptile came in there and convinced this woman, and she ate the fruit, and the man ate the fruit, and in that moment their eyes were open, but in that moment something else happened. In Romans, Paul tells us 
that sin entered the world through one man. And that man was Adam. And we know not only did sin enter the world through one man, but it, it, it spread. The Bible says just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men. All sin. He goes on to say, but the free gift is not like the trespasses. For if many died through one man's trespasses. And you can look at Romans 5 and look at it over and over and circle every time the word one is used. We're in this condition. We're in the condition that David describes in Psalm 14 because of what happened in the garden in Genesis 3. And Paul comes along. You've got a reminder from Moses. You've got a reminder from, from David. You've certainly got a reminder from Paul that no one seeks after God. No, not one. Something supernatural must happen. Something supernatural must happen. The writer of the Gospel of John tells us that what is that? It's God's supernatural work of drawing people into himself. He says that no one can come to the Father unless drawn by the Spirit. The Spirit must do some work in the life of the lost person. I wrote this and would say it like this. God's work is our only hope. God's work in the life of a lost person is our only hope. God draws, man responds. We're not robots, friends. Man must respond. They must repent of their sins, believe in the cross, and embrace Jesus. Here's what the Baptist faith and message says. We're Southern Baptist, right? Did y'all know that? <laughs> We're Southern Baptist. Our kind of a, our, 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 our thought process and what we believe flows out of the Bible, and it's been kind of uh, wrapped up into the Baptist faith and message. And uh, we adhere to the 2000. I want to read you what the writers say about this, about depravity and about man. It says, in the beginning, man was innocent of sin and was endowed by his creator with the freedom of choice. By his free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherit a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. We all understand this if we've had children, right? As soon as they can, they're going to inflict pain on a sibling. Here's what they go on to say. Only the grace of God can bring man into a holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purpose of God. So what does that mean for you? It means that we maybe ought to stop bashing our lost friends and family and begin to pray for our lost friends and family. And begin not that, that you would convince them. You will never convince anyone to follow Jesus. What you will convince them of is to embrace Christ after the Spirit does its work. And so we should pray that God does something supernatural in the life of our friends and family. I had a professor at the Baptist College of Florida, and he used to remind us that the church often spends more time praying to keep people out of heaven than we do to keep people out of hell. Think about that for a few moments. I wonder what's on the top of your prayer list. Someone who's sick or someone who's lost. Now the person that's sick may know Jesus. And they may inherit all that God ever planned for them. And, they, and, and, and Jesus has been preparing a beautiful place for them, John 14 tells us. But we've been praying for them, even in their miserable condition, to stick around for a little longer. But that person that doesn't know Christ at all. They will face eternal separation in hell. They will know eternal justice. They're way low on our prayer list. They should be at the top. And we should be praying, not that we're smart enough to convince them. 
We should be praying that the Holy Spirit of God would show up in their life and do something supernatural to begin to draw them into the, to him that they would arrive at a moment where they would surrender who they are and embrace Jesus. I'll tell you this, at 19, at 19, I embraced Christ as Savior. You've heard that. But I promise you, if you'd have told me the same story, at 18, it would have been nonsense. The Lord wasn't working in my life, wasn't drawing me into himself. And I really believe that there were people at my home church, as I started to show up and hang out, that began to pray for me by name. And the Holy Spirit of God began to work in my life in a powerful way. And, then, and, and the, the night I really heard the gospel with my heart, with my head, with my whole being, that I embraced Christ, repented of my sins, and believed in the gospel. And so I would just tell you and remind you, verses 2, 3, and, and uh, 1, 2, and 3 tell us over and over that no one is going to do this on their own. The Lord must do something. It is the grace of God. I read you again what the, the writers of this wonderful Baptist faith and message said. Only the grace of God can bring man into a holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purpose of God. And so here's the third word for you. Denial, of depravity, and deliverance. It's coming. Denial, depravity, and deliverance. It'll be there in a minute. If you look at, the, at verses 6 and 7, look at verse 6 and 7. It says, who should shame the plan of the poor? Your translation may say the righteous. But the Lord is his refuge. David's going to use three words here. In the English translation, they all have R's in them. And I believe that we all need these three R's. Here's the first one. The Lord will, is his refuge. Reminds me of Psalm 46, when the, when the writer wrote this uh, beautiful song, and let, uh, Psalm, and later Martin Luther wrote, A mighty fortress is our God from it, that he is our refuge. Verse 7, that salvation is from Israel, would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Anybody here need restoration and refuge? I would imagine few of us kind of crawled in here today with the burdens of the world crushing us. And we've just been looking and longing for some refuge that can only come from God. Some of you came in today with broken relationships, scattered and shattered families that need some restoration. The Bible goes on to say, the fortunes of his people let Jacob rejoice. Isn't it good to hear those songs? Isn't it hard to not sing along? I'm on the front row. There's nobody in front of me so I can sing all I want. Mm. Isn't it great to gather together with God's people and rejoice in the Lord? The, the background to this. The background to these two verses in Psalm 14 is the deliverance from bondage in Egypt. Here's David, generations later, remembering what the children of Israel experienced as they were released from captivity. And he's saying they got refuge. They received restoration from the Lord and they rejoiced. Jacob, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Some of you today need deliverance. Some of you came to church today with the burdens of the tyranny that I was praying about. And you need real deliverance from the bondage of sin. You have some real struggles in your life. And we listen, it's just as if you were in captivity in Egypt. Except there's not Egyptians. It's the, it's, the, it's the sin in our life that we're shackled to. And you need to be delivered from this. And I think somebody came today and said, really, Pastor, I need some refuge. It's like Psalm 46, like I said. And in, in the picture of Psalm 46 is a castle that you can climb into. 
with a large wall that would be a place of refuge from your enemies. And again, as I told you last week, David knew about enemies, didn't he? And so the Bible says that you can be restored. As I said, some of you, some of you represent families, marriages, sister, brother, mom, dad, relationships that need genuine and biblical restoration and reconciliation. You're not going to do that on your own, but the Lord will help in that. The Lord will help in that. So you might hear all this. i got to move quick. You might hear all this and you might say, Pastor, how am I supposed to respond to this? Two ways. Quickly, two ways. Here's one. One is, we should be people that recognize God is preeminent in our lives. That He is masterfully working everything together. He really is. It's not an accident that you're sitting here today, and it's not an accident that I'm standing here preaching the Word of God. It's not by the, the, my intelligence that I chose here or by the intelligence of this committee. It wasn't the intelligence that God brought you to this church. It is a sovereign act of God when He moves in our lives and rearranges us, picks colleges for us, picks spouses for us, God should be honored. He is not to be denied. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool that says, I'm in charge. We're not in charge. God is on his throne. He is king and sovereign. And then I would ask you this question about how do you respond. How do you pray for your friends and your family? The Bible says those that deny God are fools. But to you and me, they're not fools, are they? They're friends and family that we love dearly. And we want to see them come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. We haven't had a lot of talk about it lately, about the who's your one, right? Because we've been staying inside, wearing masks, and not speaking to people at Walmart. And, and uh, isn't it awkward to go to Walmart? You can't even tell who's who, any, And then you can't even tell if they're smiling or frowning at you. <laughs> We've kind of had a, a hiatus on this idea of who's your one. This is a good reminder. This is a good reminder that your one isn't going to accidentally show up at Easter. They're not going to accidentally show up at Christmas. That you're going to need to pray for them. And you're going to need to pray that God would do something in their life that only he can do. And that God would begin to work in, in their lives. And that the Holy Spirit of God would open their mind and their heart to the gospel. And that they would have a chance to respond and to believe in the glorious story of Christ and be saved. So you may say, how do I respond to this? One, we have to be reminded it's not about us. That God is king, sovereign over every heartbeat and every breath. And we've got to get before the Lord. And look at our prayer list. Some of you may keep a physical prayer list. Some of you may keep a mental prayer list. Where you're just thinking of four or five things and people you ought to be praying for. Praying about. I wonder if we challenge you to move that person that you know doesn't know Jesus to the top of the list. And begin to pray. And say, Lord, I know that based on your word, they're not going to seek you. But I pray that you would put something in their life and you would let the Holy Spirit of God change their heart that they might be able to respond to the message of Christ. Listen, we've got, we've got half a year ahead of us. We really do. We've got half a year ahead of us as a church to make a difference in our community, to share the gospel. Some of you are getting ready. I hate to break it to you, but you've got to go back to school in like a month, right? I know. Oh, me. Maybe. <laughs> Are you beginning, teenagers, to pray now about how you can be a missionary at your school? Who's your one sitting in your class that needs to hear the gospel? I've said this to you. I went through 12 years of school and nobody told me about, about Jesus. Let me say this again. I didn't go to school in New York. 12 years of public education in Alabama, Georgia, and Texas, and no, nobody ever shared the gospel with me. Listen, teenagers, you've got a chance to go back to school and find out who's your one 
and pray for them and tell them the story of Christ and how he has changed your life. And so I want to pray for you about those things. I want to pray if you've got that one and you don't know how to do, you don't know how to share Jesus, let us know. Let us know. We have people on our staff, myself, that can share and help you know how to tell someone about Christ. And I would pray that you would recognize God, that he exists, that he is real, and that he is sovereign. Stand with us for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, it's a, it's a wild season in the world. But Lord, there are still lost people out there. And you've, you've given us the message of the gospel to evangelize and to tell people about Christ. Would you use us, Father? Would you use us as part of the process as you awaken people and draw them into you? And that, Lord, they would repent and they would believe, not like robots, but human beings making human decisions. And that they would know you in a personal way. And Father, I pray. I pray for those here today that know Christ. And they've let their, they've let their pride get in the way of causing them to become practical atheists. And they deny you in many, many ways. They deny your word. They deny your place in their life. They deny your order that you're constructing for them, their path and their highway. Lord, let us repent of that and that pride and let us, let us embrace you as King, eternal, just God that loves us and deserves glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray.